Yeah, um, I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to uh, grasp some of the things you're talking about. And um, it seems to me that atmospheres occur. They, they occur. They, they occur. But that atmospheres occur. Um, and can, can, can be created. And can be and can, yeah. <laughs> and, and, I hope this is changing the atmosphere. <laughs> um, and can be created. Um, but, but, but I'm interested in the difference between how atmospheres might just happen and how, how atmospheres might be invented. And to do that, it seems to me that you need contexts. And, you know, and, and atmospheres might become spaces, for example. I'm just trying to think how to... To, to work with, 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 what, with what you're saying, I just wonder if you could give me any, any um, context for, for atmosphere. Um, so, by context, you're looking for specific examples of spaces or space times that, in which um, the ability or the capacity to become or to use atmospheres or to generate them or to render them present is important. Yes, because in some of your examples, an atmosphere occurred and was reported upon having occurred accidentally uh, versus uh, actually setting out to generate an atmosphere. Well, I mean, the last example is, is, is an example of a deliberate attention to produce a particular kind of atmosphere following a speech which doesn't work. Yes, but a um, different atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, and that's in part because the thing that was originally intended to work in a particular way didn't do that. Yes. Um, and it wouldn't necessarily be interesting as an example if it hadn't worked. Um, it's it's the, 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 the uncooperative aspect of the thing in that question that um, generates something different. Yes, yes. Um. I mean, and the broader issue there, I guess, in relation to things is the degree to which they um, cooperate with our efforts to do things with them. Um, and in relation to Google, I think it's an interesting experiment because they are, uh, whether or not it works in the long term, they are trying to um, not, not master the wind, but actually cooperate with it. Um, and to get balloons to do certain things by moving with the wind at different altitudes in order to you know, allow people to be more connected. So, in that sense, um, you know, there is a very, very uh, important connection between the meteorological context, um, between the promise, sorry, between that meteorological context, but also the promise of um, the screen as an atmospheric presence in one's home and the sense that if it's not there, there's something missing from your um, everyday experience. Um, you know, and, and a strange sense of Google as a background to your life. Um, so the color, even the symbol, the iconography. So, so what I was trying to get at was that um, difficulty in saying, well, an atmosphere is just something that happens in a space like this, and um, it's located and it's very, very, um, uh, you know, site specific. What what seems to me interesting thing about those experiments is that they're really trying to develop um, a kind of atmospheric thing power where it's not locatable but it's also premised entirely on the ability to be located, to be kind of um, pinpointed, um, to use a phrase in a particular way. Um, and that, you know, that's very different from obviously what's happening to Reagan here in this context. That is a highly choreographed, managed um, uh, atmosphere, but that makes it makes its own difference in a way, and if it doesn't work, that can be um, a problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Way basically of being sorry, connected. I can't really hear you. Oh. Hello, oh, okay, here we go. Um, yeah, so connectivity and the fact that we're all um, um, connected, and um, 
And at the same time, when I was looking at the slides, I was thinking uh, the fact that there was a controversial way of being connected because you know the balloon allows the connection for distance. And I was thinking more thinking about connection and more thinking about distance. And I don't know, really I was just trying to bring something into uh, and open the conversation about this idea of like proximity and distance and connectivity. Mm. I don't know if we could say something. Yeah, I mean, the, the balloon is the first platform for remote sensing. You know, somebody goes up in the balloon, looks down, paints a picture, and that is an early form of the technology of remote sensing. And then um, uh, the photographer Nadar, you know, starts taking photographs in the sky um, in France in the mid 19th century. Um, and that, you know, develops another kind of remote sensing in which the ability to sense something from a distance. Is, um, is crucial. Um, there's different kinds of distance um, operating there. Um, there's a kind of physical distance or, or proximity, um, but also um, you know, distance from networks and distance from um, you know, whatever is going on or whatever is happening. Maybe the, the important point there is the, the problem of becoming distant um, of establishing some distance is even is even more important today. Of actually being able to not be connected or to valorize some sense of you know being far from um, technologically, uh, um, but also geographically from networks that want you to connect. I'm not saying that that's some kind of um, privileged position from somebody speaking in the West. I just want to disconnect, but. Um, the politics of that distance, which is both virtual and geographic, um, seem to me quite important. Um, and certainly the ability to be able to be distant um, might be increasingly important. Does that make sense? Or is that yeah, yeah. I, uh, actually, kind of reactivate the thing had in my head, like, you know, with photography and this idea of, you know, resemblance and illusion, you know, the fact that, you know, it's a bit of a deal. That, that we take with uh, connectivity, I feel you know this 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 kind of um, agreement that we are connected, but you know we're not. Or yeah, you know that particular image is exactly the same of what I see, but actually it's not. Um, so mm -hmm. the, the kind of the illusion, a little bit, of being connected while we're not. Yeah, I mean, I like that image of the work in Vancouver. This, you know, the, the idea that the sky would just become a big brasher. Um, I mean, I know, I know that's not literally what's happening, but there's a, um, a certain sense in which you may not have the choice um, that uh, to go back to the Pepsi Pavilion. That it's the background that's atmospheric. It's not just um, some point that you plug into or that you connect to. Um, you know, whether or not you like it, the environment itself is. Um, is uh, this, this atmospheric context in which your attention is always being solicited. So it's not a matter of plugging out your computer um, because you don't have control of all the other ways in which you as a virtual identity are being circulated and distributed across various networks. Um, and that vision on you know, Minority Report where I think at one point um, that Tom Cruise's character walks through a shopping mall and the ad hails him and says, what do you want today? I mean, it, I, I think that's <laughs> closer um, than we think. Um, and, and the kinds of experiments that Google and Facebook, et cetera, are involved in um, are part of that, you know, rendering present a whole bunch of atmospheric possibilities as a kind of cloud of possible things to which we could respond. Um, hi, uh, just to maybe like, connect the last two questions, that thing of this kind of invisible but felt choreography that Google and Facebook seem to be uh, engineering for us, I find myself thinking a lot about scale and whether or not there's anything we can do to disrupt these kind of invisible felt, invisible but felt atmospheres and yeah, how to disrupt 
these. Mm -hmm. um, can I just ask you to what ends you would want to disrupt them? Um, maybe to know your place as an, in, as an individual, I suppose, and know your own agency um, in a world that seems like increasingly determined to kind of just make everything uh, I don't know if capital is the right word, but just make everything kind of controlled, but massive. Like to me, Google is on the same scale as the world. So I'm kind of just wondering like where maybe smaller atmospheres might, maybe it's quite optimistic, but might somehow disrupt the bigger ones. Or whether or not it's up to the world, like the big meteorological atmosphere to kind of step in there. Um. I don't really have an answer to that question, to be honest. Um, but I mean, it would be interesting to see if anybody else has an answer to that kind of question. Just, just on the point of view of, um, there are other ways in which people use balloons. They, they use them to you know, lift up cameras so they can spy over walls that aren't supposed to be spied over. You know? And they, they, there's a whole kind of um, amateur space program, um, uh, which is interesting in its own way. This, you know, but, uh, the ability to, to, to um, send things into space can be used, or into, into the upper atmosphere, can be used in um, a range of different ways. It doesn't have to be by Google. You can use it to take pictures of sites that are supposedly hidden from view. Um, and that might be a very, very minor way, but a way that people do use as part of counter cartography practices. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is. It's not something that I have any expertise on, but there are people, other geographers, you know, working on, um, say, in relation to uh, uh, emergencies and evacuation, and people like Peter Aidy and Ben Anderson, and how um, the kind of atmosphere of reassurance um, that is present in a range of spaces is developed through a whole bunch of experiments with performances of, about how people are responding to certain situations. Um, and that there's a very, very soft, ambient um, sense of uh, expectation that one might have if you go into an airport space, for instance, that's been very carefully um, designed and controlled. And that you expect also, as part of that, that people will know what to do. For some reason, the question of <laughs> whether or not the fire alarm would go off came up earlier in the discussion. There's just this expectation that everybody would be able to get out. Um, and that's in part just through the simple presence of those you know, very, very friendly green signs. Um, so the engineering of environments to induce particular, very, very low key senses of what might happen and what might be done when something happens um, is, is really, really important. Um, you know, obviously anticipation is engineered in more active ways in, in a range of contexts through music and um, signs and so forth. Um, but I, I'm just thinking one example of things like, okay, I mean, uh, you know, this is just off the top of my head, but they all claim in anticipation of somebody. Mm -hmm. I think that's interesting. I mean, there's, there's a medium of tension. Yeah, and then governing anticipation um, again, as people like Ben Anderson have argued, is, is quite central to um, the, you know, the logics of a whole range of political technologies that emerge after, particularly after the Second World War. Um, you know, anticipating what might happen if the bomb goes off, or you know, anticipating what might happen in a certain state of emergency. Um, and, and you know, it's a really interesting kind of infrastructure of affect in contemporary life that we take for granted um, in a whole set of domains of, um, of experience from you know, travel to being in a building. You know. But I know that you know, this wasn't so much about dance or um, 
choreography of those sorts of things. Um, but I do think there's a kind of um, choreographic promise in some of these projects. It's about you know, the expectation that one is able to you know, do things with things even, even though those things are not necessarily um, um, you know, inert or passive in the way that um, you know, this, we might think this table is. Um, and and, and um, a realization that that's an opportunity. So, that, I mean, that's a very expansive sense of the choreographic, but nonetheless, it, I think it's a process to which one, would, one could use the term choreography. If it's about the arrangement of bodies in space-time um, so that they might generate new connections and affects. They might not always work. I mean, I'm not saying that these things are always successful. But there is a kind of strange alliance between um, uh, you know, companies like Google, etc., and, and artists about you know, trying to imagine new possibilities, which are to do with choreographing elements and atmospheres in all kinds of ways. Um, is that right? Yeah. Um, I was just thinking a bit about invisible and felt, or invisible but felt, which is something you were saying, and um, some of the thoughts that were going around in my head about balloons, and maybe balloons that, that drift rather than balloons that fall. So like the kind of the balloons that end up in different countries and different places. Um, it's, I think it's almost the balloon is the thing, because there's this thing that you know is there, and you know that it's there because you feel it, but almost the balloon shows the trajectory. It shows a pattern of movement which you can feel, but you can't always tie it into. And the balloon and the bubble I thought was really great because I think the whole interest of that is the fragility of it. So almost that there's this movement out there that we want to access or that we are aware of, but that you can't, or that you only get for a moment and it disappears again. Um, which, judging by the cooling towers um, around Google and Facebook, is, is very different because I still think of those internet companies as being very, very weighted and very much grounded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the idea that the balloon is a device for making things explicit or rendering them present. In, in, um, so, so, you know, in order to try and figure out um, how the dynamics of air currents operate in certain spaces. Um, you know, scientists did take over these big abandoned, not abandoned, but um, unused um, Zeppelin or, or airship hangars and released balloons into the air to see how they would move. So, so there is a way in which, on a very, very simple level, those devices have been used to try and think about how air currents work in, in, in certain spaces. Um, and the other way in which they make an atmosphere explicit is just that simple act of being present. Um, you know, you put a balloon in a room or you pin a balloon outside a door to suggest that something is going on. It's a kind of a, an invitation to think that there might be something out of the ordinary there. Um, and, and that's not necessarily to say that that's benign or that's about joy. Um, uh, you know, for some people, balloons are incredibly scary things or they're associated with death and grief and loss. Um, somebody asked me a question before about the fact that, um, you know, well, balloons are just all about celebration and festivity. Um, but but if, if, you, if you Google, um, you know, uh, balloon, you know, um, uh, a child death, those terms, this just, it kind of breaks your heart. The series of stories around releasing balloons um, and the way in which that operates to modulate grief. The other side of that, of course, is the way in which balloon release is highly contested, and there's a whole set of movements against releasing balloons because of the environmental damage it does. Um, and that is inflected through different cultural contexts. So in Brazil, there's a whole set of debates um, about um, the use of kind of fire balloons um, as a popular cultural practice and the identification of those who engage in that as, you know, almost like domestic terrorists. You know, so, so there's um, lots of ways in which that story can be told, um, which are about 
making atmosphere um, present, if only to contest it, if only to say you can't do that sort of thing up there because it's going to um, impact in a particular way. Um, but I, I mean, I, I quite like the story about um, releasing balloons in the hope that it'll end up on the other side of the Iron Curtain and that way will, you know, um, generate some kind of unsettling of those who find the balloons. And also that that was linked with a whole bunch of people in the US releasing balloons um, in order to demonstrate their ability to counter the threat of the um, Soviet bloc. I mean, it, it's remarkably naive, um, but so much energy was invested in it that it seemed to make it, it seemed to matter to those who were doing it. I mean, there are other, sorry, there are other examples that didn't, are not in this talk, you, you know, people talked about Martin Creed's work uh, in the discussion earlier on, um, and that's a different way in which volume, I think, is, is rendered present, um, or Scattered Crowd by William Forsyth. Um, another really interesting work, um, uh, which is, yeah, you know, re really, really beautiful. Um, but also, uh, um, I think, allows you to think more clearly about what it, what it might mean to choreograph things and their uncooperative qualities. Or um, Christo's, uh, you know, big air package, which in essence is a big balloon in which you can, you know, you can get into it and um, uh, feel overwhelmed by the sheer majesty of the sculpture and maybe the artist as well. So, so there are other projects that you could easily talk about in relation to um, how atmosphere and air are made present through um, balloons of different kinds, as, as spheres that envelop in different ways. Um, you touched on some very exciting things, and, and, it, and they also link into some of the, the processes, the artists we've been uh, working with today in the building. Um, one thing we were, we were talking about that came from Baradi as well was this idea of c conspiration, people breathing together. And uh, this morning we, we did a big practice in this room that, were, that involved breath and unbeknownst, half of the group were also working in the stairwell and we were just literally working with air currents in the building. So we, we, we started to talk as a group how, how we were kind of linking one way of dealing with air in the group, in the kind of social sense, and the and the kind of um, it, through through attention in the body, and then also this other way of of listening to this building through atmosphere, through through the air current. So I had no idea you were going to be talking about um, atmosphere quite in this way. So it's very exciting just to hear you talk about the things you've been talking about. <laughs> I won't respond to that. <laughs> I'll leave that in the air. Um, but no, yeah, I mean, I think it's um, it's a kind of experiment similar to the one that I talked about in relation to these um, large hangars, which in some ways are similar to these kinds of spaces. I mean, that, that there's um, there's a really interesting uh, question of volume there, and, and what you do with you know that bit that's up there. Uh, you know, how how do you make use of it? Um, how does it become part of whatever it is? is happening on the ground. Um, and I mean, that's what impresses me with or about something like um, Scattered Crowd. Because um, I, I saw that in, in, in Dresden just before, Christ, just before Christmas. And uh, yeah, as a way of distributing things in the volume of a, of a space, it was quite uh, intriguing. Um, Coupled with the kind of looping refrain of a sound, very, very simple, um, you know, I find it very, very powerful. I don't know if you're all familiar with that work. Um, it's um, a piece in which there are hundreds, if not more than that, thousands, uh, tethered pairs of balloons. So there's a, um, a white balloon filled with helium that is tethered on a line to a uh, translucent air-filled balloon. And they're distributed, you know, in a space like this. And on one level, it looks very passive, but on another level, it's interesting because of the work that needs to go into its ongoing production. I mean, you talked about attending to things over the course of an event. Um, if you stay in the room for long enough, 
you, you know, you start to see the people who are working on this piece rearranging the balloons, because if all the balloons cluster in one place, then the, the space doesn't quite, or the work doesn't seem um, as effective. Or, you know, balloons start to sink and they need to be, uh, you know, removed and replaced. So, so um, it's a really interesting process of observation to see this thing being kept um, alive through an ongoing tending or, you know, attention to its capacities to draw your attention in a different way. Um, so I might have thought it was just a really interesting work, much, to my mind, much more impressive than Christo's big air package, which is too much like a cathedral, that's just my view. But you may disagree with me. I'm just kind of curious, because I know at some point we've talked about breaking this up. I mean, when, as we were talking earlier on in a group, I had this idea, well, why don't you have a kind of lucky dip, and I'll just print off the pages individually, and then I'll, you can you know, pull out individual balloon stories. So you could have had John Kerry at the beginning, and you know, the echo balloon following that. Um, it might have, might have been slightly different. Well, I think in terms of um, continuing this process, uh, we, could, we could split and we have another two hours in the building. So you're welcome to stay and continue the conversations. We've got a bar downstairs. Um, but also, yeah, please, please take in the atmosphere, um, talk, um, talk with us. And um, yeah, I'd also like to thank Siobhan Davies Dance Company, who are also partner in this festival with independent dance. But most of all, I'd like to thank you, Derek, for this evening's talk. Well, thanks for yeah. having me.